afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, be calling this meeting to order. Um, I have Dennis Bidwell, who is the counselor from Ward 2, and I have Councilor Jim Nash from Ward 3, and I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge, Vice Chair. Um, I also want to let everybody know that you are being, in this meeting, is being videoed. Public comment. Is there anybody who would like to speak in front of the podium? Brian um, Bruce. Do you want to stand up and give us your name and your address? My name is Brian Bruce and I'm at 32 Round Hill Road. And um, I wanted to comment on the overall condition and the length of the condition of Round Hill Road. Uh, we purchased our property at, uh, about 11 years ago. And uh, other than perhaps filling some potholes over the last 11 years, there's been no resurfacing done. And yet they're at the top of the hill especially, but also out elsewhere on the street, there's been incredible construction going on. The Clark School sold the campus, other than their one building across the street from my property. And um, it's gone through a couple of owners and they have and then we had a serious fire there about six, seven years ago, and one of the buildings was completely destroyed and then knocked down. So there's been a sequence of events over the last 10 or 11 years where the roads have just been brutalized. The road has been brutalized. And um, in my opinion, I mean, I go to the Y three, four times a week. I go down the Elton, I take a ride on the Massasoit, and one of the things that brought this to my mind most intensely was the fact that it seemed like Massasoit has been resurfaced twice in the last couple, three years. And so I'm wondering why it is that we don't have that sort of, of uh, positive uh, treatment as Massasoit might. And uh, so I encourage, as you're starting to set up uh, work being done by the DPW or by your road construction crews, I would love to have you factor in Round Hill Road uh, into that schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Buck Degendorf, live at 88 Round Hill Road, same topic. I was led to believe though that the, the lady who is responsible for streets was at this meeting and that it would be an agenda item, is that true? We're going to be talking about yes. streets. Yes, yeah. so streets is a topic for the meeting. Yes. Okay. Not for the whole meeting. No, but one yes. of the topics. Yes. Well, that's what I wanted to comment on was just that topic. I have the map that the city so nicely <laughs> published to show the worst streets in Northampton. We live on one of the worst streets in Northampton. There are others as bad, but there are others that are not as bad and they're better taken care of than Round Hill Road. So what I'm asking for is a review of the priorities, a commitment to a timeline. I would like to know when Round Hill Road is going to be replaced not just pothole fixed. Those are band-aids that wash out. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Jen Cope and I live at 14 Jewett Street, which is only one block long. It's between Forts Avenue and Vernon Street. Um, and our street is worse than Round Hill Road. <laughs> but um, my real concern is, is the condition of uh, the street citywide. Um, and, you know, they are in generally bad shape. Um, I know the city has a pavement management program, which I think is laudable. Um, it's a rational way to evaluate and prioritize uh, streets, taking into a wide variety of factors and so forth, and I am well acquainted with, with pavement management. Um, but I don't think the city's going to get to where it needs to be just by um, using the resources that it can allocated. Uh, because of the 
really bad condition of so many streets, um, allocating a million or three million dollars a year is never going to make it. You're going to be just falling farther and farther and farther behind. And you know some of those streets will just turn to dust because they're too low on the priority list. And I mean, if that's the policy decision of the city, um, that concerns me. Um, but I think a serious look needs to be taken at the totality of the condition of our infrastructure, uh, particularly the streets, and consider a bond issue that would address uh, the city streets, sidewalks, and bikeways, um, and bring them up insofar as possible to a state of good repair. Once you're at a state of good repair, then applying the pavement management system will pretty much keep you there. You know, with crack sealing and, and periodic, uh, you know, maintenance, and then uh, over a period of time doing resurfacing. And you can maintain streets for a very, very long time, provided that they're properly constructed to begin with. Uh, but so many of them, I think, never were constructed properly, at least, you know, looking at the evidence on the ground. Uh, the drainage is poor. Um, they were just, you know, just asphalt on top of dirt. There was no proper uh, subgrade uh, that provides for drainage of water under the surface. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a big problem. And I think only by doing something like um, a substantial bond issue and probably a proposition two and a half override, you know, will we get to a state where we should be? And um, you know, I know there was lot, lots of other infrastructure. We have a new, relatively new police station. I'm a little bit aware of the problems with the parking garage and so forth. And you know, lots of other facilities in the in the city that have to be taken care of. But I think the the streets and sidewalks have been really seriously let go. Uh, it's difficult to take a walk in our neighborhood because the sidewalks are in such poor shape. They're, they're heaved up or, uh, you know, there are just gaps in the pavement. Um, and, you know, people end up walking in the street um, because the sidewalks are worse than the roads. Um, so it's really, I think, uh, a difficult and unfortunate situation. I'm not blaming anybody because I know about the problems of budget constraints over time. But I think uh, it's, it's time for us to really consider doing something, uh, as I say, that will get us kind of a quantum leap to, uh, to be then in a position where the city can have the street infrastructure generally um, in a state of good repair. I think we're not there at this point, and at the rate we're going, we're, we're just going to fall farther and farther behind. So that's what I basically wanted to say. And I'm sorry that the public works director isn't here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, she, she, she is here. So is the Hi. mayor. Hi. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> so. Anybody else like to speak? Hi, I'm Janice Moulton, and I live at 55 Prospect Street. And I applaud <laughs> what Jim said. I know Jim from the Florence Community Band. Uh, this winter, potholes took out two of our tires. We had to rent a car because we only had one spare. Uh, the uh, replacement tires, because a car needs four appropriate tires, was over $900. I filed a claim, and the city gave us $488 back. And I was very happy about that. Dennis was the only city councilor who, that I emailed about it uh, that responded. Thank you. Uh, and he's not even my city councilor. Um, but I think that something should be done because there are many people who had flat tires who did not know about filing a claim. And when you do file a claim, you're supposed to say what your what house 
the hole that got your car is in front of, and I knew because it was my street. Soon afterwards, my street, Prospect Street, got pothole filled. They're now new potholes. They're small, but since the winter, they're already closed. And Trumbull Street, which is the adjoining street, did not get filled for months because nobody lost the tire. I'm not sure why. But anyhow, I'm grateful for the money we got. I'm grateful that, that um, potholes were repaired. But I agree with Jim that something should be done. And I'm not sure it's cost effective for the city to pay back all the dead tires. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. I also, oh, okay. I just want to emphasize the traffic. I, my name is Ed Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. And what I want to talk about is the size of the traffic. You do not see trucks on Massasoit. I go to the Y also. Remotely the size of the trucks on Round Hill Road. You have trucks that are, that are semis, that are carrying very heavy um, earth moving equipment. You have trucks filled with stones that are earth moving trucks that are struggling to get up the hill because their engines can't stand the weight. This is not ordinary traffic. You do have cars and pickups, but you also have extremely heavy trucks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here in rebuttal. <laughs> I disagree with the comments of Gentleman Jim from Hewitt Street. I don't believe his street's worse than Round Hill Road. <laughs> I would like to solve it, or resolve the problem by putting the city council in the back of a UPS truck and drive you up and down Round Hill Road. <laughs> I think after maybe three trips, you'll talk. You'll divulge your company headquarters and everything. <laughs> Thank you. Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. When the development was proposed, and when there were a series of meetings, there were discussions about Round Hill as a glacial drumlet. As such, it is filled with streams. Uh, no one did a survey study of the drumlet. Probably should have been done. There were places on the road where the water bubbles up from the road which seems to be evidence of a spring. So it's not just a matter of resurfacing. I mean, that hill needs to be looked at carefully. Yes, the, tr the trucks are terrible. They go, there are weeks when they go up and down, up and down, up and down. The project has been profoundly destructive. And I think the city needs to realize that uh, neighbors are being held hostage because I suspect you won't do anything about Round Hill until the project is finished. And probably in between now and then, there will be more years when um, the development is exempt from taxes. Now I think that total picture needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Teddy Rose at 96 Round Hill. Uh, I would just like to uh, add uh, some more fuel to this fire um, <laughs> because I think it's, you know, every time we look out and we see somebody coming in to fix some of those holes, we think, oh, phew, they're finally coming to fix something. But then, the fixing seems to always be sort of not exactly the way it should be, so that new kinds of lumps and bumps and so forth are forming, and other ones are totally ignored. And they came actually, I think, this year in three sections to try to redo some of those potholes. And I'm not sure that there was a huge difference between the time they fixed it and before that. It's just so bad, and I know that last year we were all very disappointed that the city wasn't doing anything about the street, but we certainly did not expect that they would do nothing about the street this year, 
And as I say, the piecemeal work that has been done has been so poorly done that it does almost nothing and, in fact, in some situations, creates new problems. Thank you. Um, I would like a motion um, for approval of the previous minutes on June 4th, 2018. So moved. Second. What I'd like to do, counselors, is take 5A and move it up on a discussion of citywide paving issues. Mayor David Narkowitz and the Department of Public Works Director, Donna Lascalia. Mayor, Donna? Yes. Good afternoon, counselors and residents who are here today. Um, so, uh, let's, I guess, step back a little bit and talk about, first, just from a process point of view, um, each year, you know, I submit the Capital Improvement Program to the City Council, which outlines all of the capital priorities for the next five years. And, uh, and then we follow up with uh, spending and appropriation requests later in the spring. That's the first part of our budgetary process that we're required to do by charter. Um, and then we move forward to the operating budget. Um, and so we completed the capital improvement program, which you approved, you know, actually a little bit earlier this year to get ahead of the interest rates uh, increases. And then just most recently, you approved the operating budget. So in terms of paving, um, when I became mayor uh, in 2013, like many communities, and that was the first fiscal year that I, my, my first fiscal year budget, I suppose, um, like many communities, we were only relying on Chapter 90 uh, funds uh, to do um, our paving projects. Um, the vast majority of communities around us, particularly in Western Mass, rely exclusively on Chapter 90. Um, for those of you who don't know what Chapter 90 is, it's a portion of your gas tax that's collected. Uh, the state collects it, Mass DOT, you know, uh, then reallocates it to the state. Interestingly, um, probably about 80% of it gets allocated um, uh, from cities and towns, from all of us paying gas taxes, we get about 20% of it in Chapter 90 money. The state keeps 80% of it, mm -hmm. roughly. I, I don't quote me on those numbers, but it's a, the percentage is perversely inverse uh, to what actually goes back out to cities and towns. Um, so each year, the, um, the state does a Chapter 90 bond bill. Um, they never do it on time. They never do it early enough to actually be helpful to cities and towns. Um, this year, the governor, after much prodding, finally introduced something um, in, in, you know, in February. They know they have to do it every year, but so they, they introduced it. And lo and behold, it's the same $200 million Chapter 90 bond bill that's been in place for the last five years. So basically level funded uh, the amount of money going back to cities and towns in, in roads and bridge projects, which we all know the cost of asphalt, the cost of fuel, the cost of construction and labor costs goes up exponentially each year. Um, so, uh, tired of just getting funded that, that level amount each year from uh, Mass uh, DOT, Chapter 9 through Chapter 90, which is about a million dollars a year that we receive. Um, we began in FY15 contributing some additional city money. We tried to work it in as part of our tax base um, to be able to, as part of our overall debt schedule, uh, to be able to start funding um, some additional monies to try to catch up on our backlog of uh, paving, which, you know, by the way, if you've studied anything about infrastructure in the United States or in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or any of the 50 states, um, we, we have, a def we have a, a, an infrastructure deficit. It's a, it's a national problem. Um, and I won't get into the... Uh, macro and microeconomic reasons for that and tax policy reasons for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we basically, at some point, decided we could have a free lunch in the United States and we could give everybody tax cuts and uh, we wouldn't have to pay for anything. The, you know, the, the magic fairies would fix the roads. Um, but that's basically the tax policy in the United States. Um, so in FY, after, after putting in $500,000 a year in my first five-year capital plan, uh, which was basically uh, 
15, 16, 17, and 18 uh, those uh, those years. So we were basically matching 50% uh, what we were getting from the state. Um, in the most recent five-year capital uh, plan, I propose to triple that. Um, so I propose to put in $1.5 million. So you just approved a borrowing authorization for $1.5 million, which we are committing ourselves for, to try to, to try to maintain over the next five years. Um, and we just went out to borrow on that $1.5 million. Um, and so basically tripling the amount that, we're, that we were previously spending, which was, again, going from zero to $500,000 to match that $1 million, which, again, has stayed the same. Um, and we've got our same, same allotment of it. It has not gone up. Um, so I say that, but the, the way we pay for the debt service is obviously you know, as part of our operating budget. We allocate a certain amount of, of funding um, in our operating budget. Um, the operating budget that you just approved uh, last Thursday or two Thursdays ago, um, as you know, has a structural deficit built into it. Um, we did a general override uh, four years ago in order to try to maintain our basic city services, our police, our fire, DPW, et cetera. Um, and we've been um, waiting, uh, hoping that potentially there might be more funding coming from the state. Um, one of the things we just had a large discussion about, and uh, unfortunately a ruling by the Supreme Judicial Court, what, which was that some additional taxation on high income earners that would have been 50% would have been dedicated to transportation funding like Chapter 90 uh, was shot down. Um, so the challenge is we have, you know, we have a significant backlog of roads and bridges. We do use a pavement management system um, and we um, are allocating additional funds. Um, and so when I hear let's, we should just float a bond to fix it all, um, the question becomes, what, what, uh, how do we pay for that? How do we pay for the debt service? Already to maintain this tripling of the debt service uh, on paving this year, um, you know, we're, we're, we have a budget that has a structural deficit of you know, just a little bit short of $300,000, and we know that's going to increase over the next several years you know, because of the fiscal stability plan if nothing changes. One of the things we were hoping for was more Chapter 90 money because of the uh, fair share amendment, which obviously is now off the table. So, um, so th that's sort of the that's sort of the fiscal situation, which is not I don't I hope it's not news to any of you up there um, in terms of what we have. Um, so, even if we were to say, okay, instead of the 1.5 that we're doing for the next you know four years after the 1.5 that's just been allocated, if we try to do all of that at once. Um, in six years, that would add another six to seven hundred thousand dollars to our general fund operating budget. So we have to figure out what we would cut in terms of how we would cut that funding out of our budget in order to be able to absorb that debt service. And again, it also um, it also assumes that we wouldn't have all the other debt obligations that we have. You know, school roofs that need to be fixed. Um, you know, JFK just hit the 20 year mark on its roof, so I suspect we'll be looking at a new roof for that soon. Um, all the other capital needs, the, the other infrastructure that we have to also work on as part of it. So that's sort of the, the larger picture in terms of, and you know, it's, we can talk, uh, it was mentioned that we could do an override for the roads. Um, the challenge with that, of course, is um, how large would that override need to be to do that? Um, and we also know that we are potentially looking at the possibility of needing a general operating override in the next several years just to maintain, you know, just to keep schools, you know, functioning and public safety functioning. So it becomes a question of at what point, um, do, how, do we, how do we ask the taxpayers to do that and can they afford to do that? Um, so that's sort of the chat, we're sort of crunched between maintaining the operating side of the house as well as trying to make these deep investments, not only in roads and bridges, but obviously water, sewer, um, stormwater systems, uh, radio infrastructure, vehicle infrastructure, I can, and can go on and on and on. So what we've attempted to do, the process we've attempted to do, is to take a look using that pavement management program, um, looking at what our most serious uh, road needs are each year, looking at what funding we have available, and then the DPW um, attempting to, to match up what is the best use of those funds given the amount we have, 
given the engineering, uh, given the engineering reports, given the costs, given the infrastructure, underground infrastructure in the roads, et cetera. And we typically each year publish a pavement memo for you, uh, which outlines you know, what we're finishing up for the fiscal year and the projects that we're looking at um, for the next fiscal year. So normally you know when you approve that $1.5 million like you did this year, um, most likely what that's gonna be spent on. Again, subject to going out to bid, um, getting bid prices, um, uh, you know, using estimates obviously, but whether or not those bids will come in uh, where we think they will. Um, you know, we have a collection of streets this year which the DPW director can talk with you about um, and uh, that, that went out to bid. Some of the bids came in much higher. Um, obviously, we've all noticed gasoline prices have gone up. Um, uh, uh, thanks to our brilliant uh, diplomatic strategy and trade strategy, no doubt. Um, and, uh, and so um, we're seeing rising gas prices. It's now north of $3 again. And, uh, and so that's going to factor in. Uh, to the bids that we're receiving in terms of um, fuel prices and, and all the other, and obviously asphalt is a petroleum-based product. So, um, so that's the challenge we face. Uh, you know, I, I know that you've asked, can you give us a clearer picture of what are you gonna do in the next several years? And people, I wanna know each road you're gonna pave over the next five years. And um, um, that's not really, uh, I don't think that that's prudent to, to do. I don't think it's realistic to do, and we come to you one year at a time to get the borrowing authorization. And again, even that's based on what's the fiscal condition of the city. That's assuming we're gonna get a million dollars from chapter 90. We don't know what's gonna happen, whether that's gonna remain the same, whether it's gonna go up, we don't know. Um, and so, you know, we are, but we are constantly monitoring that list that's being updated. And the other thing that happens is roads that were not in um, a difficult condition can then suddenly rise up. Um, that happened this winter, which I would, you know, I, I know that this does not provide much comfort to people, but this was one of the more challenging winters in terms of the temperature swings that we had. Um, we had uh, incredible temperature swings, uh, the sort of an early thaw, um, then it got cold again and froze again. Um, and the challenge, of course, is trying to make pothole repairs um, during the middle of winter when uh, there are no asphalt uh, plants open yet, um, and we're trying to make our own, you know, asphalt using our using our hot boxes. Um, and we're also trying to when it's also snowing once a week, as it did pretty steadily, you know, through March and April. And we're trying to allocate all our, our work crews to plowing the streets and. You know, the potholes are filled with water. So we, as many of you know, we've been trying to triage them and allocate as much resources and fund. It's not a matter of the funding, it was more a matter of the availability of asphalt, the weather conditions, um, and, uh, and just the, the, the sheer number of potholes, which I can tell you in talking to my colleagues in other communities, it was a, a difficult year, including on, on state highways as well, um, not just local roads. So, um, so that's kind of the big picture. Um, I guess I want to know what questions you have for me uh, in terms of what it is. Uh, the, uh, again, it, it comes down to resources. Um, the DBW can talk, to, the director can talk to you about you know what our total inventory. If we were to you know waive, if we wanted to fix everything right now and bring it up, I think it's on the order of north of seventy million dollars. Uh, again, your general fund budget is about ninety-six million dollars. Um, so, uh, so that therein lies the challenge, is how we do that. So we are uh, allocating more tax dollars to it to match the state dollars. Um, and again, it comes down to if, if, even if you were to do you know, a six, $6 million all at once, um, it would be surprising how few roads that would actually pave. Um, and then our debts capacity would be quickly absorbed. It would be difficult to maintain that over time. Um, again, given the financial constraints that we have now, the amount of revenue we have each year, new revenue to work with. Um, so again, these are all the challenges you hear me talk about in the context of the general fund budget, but they have a cascade effect on our ability to be able to fund the capital side of the budget. Um, we do have several debt exclusion overrides uh, that are on the books that we are still paying down that are part of people's tax rates now. Um, we have the uh, J, the, well, actually, the JFK Middle School was paid off, but we still have the high school 
um, and we still have the uh, fire station and we still have the police station. Those were all debt exclusion overrides. Um, so that's sort of the big picture. Massasoit Street, uh, the, the second most recent paving of that was actually done by Columbia Gas, not by the city, and it's because they had to tear up so much of the road um, after we had just paved it five or six years ago uh, to replace gas lines that they were actually forced to pay to return the road to the condition that they found it when they started chasing gas leaks that ended up being all through the entire length of the street. So that was, not, that was sort of a, an odd situation paid for by uh, Columbia Gas. Um, so questions for me on that level before I turn it over to the DPW director. Well, um, Mayor, thank you for coming in today no and speaking with us. Um, and that um, I, I think the, the discussion we were hoping to have is, it, and we're starting to have it here, which is, I mean, we, we, we've heard from people, we've heard from citizens today who are talking about maybe we need to do some sort of override, put some to, uh, to figure out a plan to address the roads. And I think that, you know, that in terms of making those choices and bringing it to the, to the voters, because ultimately it would be an override, is to uh, have it clear to people as to what that choice might look like. Um, that you've mentioned there's 70, you know, $70 million at least in road work that's needed. And, and, um, and to, you know, is there a way, um, how, the police what station are, was ten million, just to give you some perspective. I'm sorry. Uh, the police station override was ten million dollars, just to give you some right. perspective. Right. Um, it would be huge, and uh, but I, I think in terms of people coming to us and asking, you know, what, can you squeeze this money out of the budget? And we we've gone over the budget. We've we've done a lot of work with with your office, and and that we understand that every dollar is scrutinized and spent. Where it's supposed to be, um, so we would need to come up with some sort of new financial plan and a new way to address uh, uh, the condition of our roads. And um, that I think that people just want what I'm hearing is people want to have that discussion. And we may, in the end, may not choose to go that course. I mean, right now, thanks to the capital improvement plan, we are incrementally, you know, addressing some of that. And at the same time, uh, we've experienced some really difficult weather, and it's really uh, put a dent in our road inventory. Um, so that um, that our plan to maybe catch up is now we're starting to fall behind a little bit. But I, I, I guess the, the the question is is for for me based on what I've heard is um, you know we have this big. Um, problem to address, and uh, are the can we come up with different strategies? I mean, we have one right now through you know through our five-year plan that will help us tend to some of the worst roads, but maybe a a, a bigger plan might want to be considered to you know, a bigger strategy to address our roadways, and but it's, and not, just, it's not a strategy; it's more money. It I mean, is more money. That, I, I, I get it. It's, called, it's more money. I, I understand. I mean, that's you know. So that's the question. And you know, and, I, and I, so mean, I, I think mean, that's having a discussion about what those numbers yeah. would look like, so people would understand yeah. what we'd be coming back to them. You know that okay. You know, uh, we're going to do twenty million dollars worth of roadways because here's the the worst ones on the list. And anyway, that that was my thought. Okay. I, I would just uh, again. I'm trying to. I have to try to balance the short term, you know, the operational needs of the city versus the capital needs of the city, and so that's the challenge that I have. Um, happy to have the conversation. I just don't want it to be. I want it to be grounded in reality. So, you know, we spent a lot of time this year with many of your constituents in Ward Three who wanted us to add more money to Bridge Street School. We need more staff at Bridge Street School. We needed, you know. And we are because we have you know a high need population that needs additional staff there, and so we did allocate many more resources to that. Uh, you know that's that's 
hundreds of thousands of dollars that could would be debt potentially debt service to pay for debt service, right. um, and many of those teachers' salaries are being paid with override funds. Um, when we did that override, you know, that two and a half million dollar override, a million of which immediately went to the schools. So those are just. I just want us to make sure that we don't compartmentalize the conversation, and that we're just talking about because it's all. It's at the end of the day, you know, as a former DPW director said, I'll pay as much money as you give me. I'll pay. I mean, that's that's their their goal is to maintain the roads and maintain the sewer and maintain the you know with the resources they have allocated. Um, so that's just the challenge. Um, so, and I also think it's important to. Uh, again, understand the roles in terms of um, you know our, our respective roles in terms of the executive overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the city, um, explicitly given the task of developing capital you know, planning and projections, and then bringing it to the city council. Um, so I kind of feel like we maybe should have been having this conversation like four months ago as part of the capital program that you approved. Um, we are going to have another opportunity to do it next year which will be a real world exercise because then you can say we don't want to fund all that technology in the schools we don't want to fund uh, those <laughs> police cruisers we don't want to fund that we want to pave streets um, and that's certainly a valid choice uh, but it's at the end of the day it's a financial choice which is the role of the council um, the council's role is not to develop strategy or to operate the data you know direct the day-to-day -day operations of the DPW so I also just make sure that we um, we have those. Goals. I know your your uh, your clerk had sent us something about South Hadley, you know, providing some information to their select board. The select board is the executive in South Hadley; they're not the legislative body, so it's a little bit of a different framework. Yep. Um, well, yes. Thank thank you, Mayor and Director Oscalia back there for 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 for. for joining us in this conversation. I think the, the point you just touched on is, the, is critical. That, yes, we should have been having a more in-depth conversation about some of these things very, you know, earlier in the process. And earlier even than the, the in my view, the, the presentation to the council of the, of the capital improvement program. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty baked document at that point. And, and I do think earlier in the process, a more free-flowing conversation about, about priorities uh, earlier in that process, and, and I know there's a, a, a capital improvement committee that's, that's set up to do that, but I think maybe perhaps a more robust and participatory conversation at that level would, would bring some of these questions of priorities into the conversation early. So I, so I think I think the, the, the timing of conversations like this is, is, a, is a critical point. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, was, was one of those that, that encouraged our, our committee to, to, to host this conversation, in part because um, I, I don't think any of us are unaware of the financial realities. It's just that interest, we do have a massive national infrastructure deficit. We have a massive, rel, you know, relative to things, infrastructure deficit here. And it's part because infrastructure doesn't have a natural advocacy group. I mean, individual potholes do, but kind of advocating for uh, infrastructure doesn't have its constituency in the way that the Bridge Street uh, uh, school does and, and, and in the way that, that, that other more immediate services do. And so I, I think it's just appropriate that every once in a while we provide an airing for folks to talk about infrastructure and the, and the, and the needs. Uh, not that when everything is fully, fully fleshed out, uh, any of us would agree that it needs to replace other things on the list of priorities, but I don't think it's a bad idea for there to be a little more advocacy on behalf of, of, of infrastructure, and in this case, uh, the condition of our, of our streets and our, and our sidewalks. I think a lot of what may be missing, and I, I say this as someone who's on the receiving end of a lot of comment, as you can tell, most of, most of the audience here <laughs> are my friends in Ward 2, um, is I don't think it's. I don't think it is widely understood that we the the real list. Of, if we were to really address what we need, it would cost us seventy million dollars. I don't think there is an understanding of what, of how relatively little would be accomplished in terms of road miles with six million dollars. I think. I think. I think. I think part of it is just everyone, council, 
the public is better understanding the magnitude of the problem, the challenges, and just what you do get for a million dollars these days. So maybe one one thing that would be helpful just today, you, you, you kind of invited the question, just what, what would we get with if, if we were to if we were to find a magic way to spend six million dollars of our local money. You know, it would replace other things and setting aside for the moment what all it would replace, what would six million dollars get us if we were I think this is a good segue to have the director talk to you about the current paving projects and what where what your you know, 2.5 million is getting you this year, uh, and it gives you a sense of, you know, the scale of what some of these roads cost. Um, and, you know, we've talked, and, you know, so that, that might be a good segue for her to talk about it, because she's seeing real world pricing coming in uh, for the five, six, seven streets that we're looking at this spring. Um, and so I, I may have her come up now and just talk to you a little bit about that. Great. Um, I'll start by saying that I I hear from folks every day about the condition of the roads and I I just want to make it clear that that I take it very personally and you know I'm not someone who sits in my office and and ignores people and I take a lot of pride in what I do. I take a lot of pride in my department. Everyone who works there does. You know, this is this is something that we are very concerned about, and we actively work 